Hallelujah. Glory to the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Lord is good. The Lord is greatly to be praised. Hallelujah. 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 He is the almighty God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's the most high God. Oh, he's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of the glory. He's worthy of the honor. Come on and praise his name. Come on and give him glory in this house. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Hallelujah. Oh, clap your hands. Oh, ye people, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are worthy, O oh Lord. You are worthy, God. You are worthy, Lord. You gave us the victory in Jesus. We praise you. We magnify you. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to your name. Glory to your name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. All glory and praise belongs to you, Father. Hallelujah. We welcome your presence in our midst today. We welcome your presence in our midst today. We welcome your presence in our hearts and our lives. Your manifest presence. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're welcome. Be exalted. Be exalted in us. Be exalted in our praise. Be exalted in our worship. Hallelujah. Oh, God. There is none like you. There is no other God beside you. You are the only true and living God. Be glorified. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. We welcome all of you who gathered in the sanctuary today, and we welcome those of you who are joining us online this morning. We just want the Lord to be glorified, and as God is glorified, I know, we know that we will be blessed. Amen. Tabernacle of Praise Church International, we welcome all of you who've joined us today. Uh, and let us turn our attention to the reading of God's Word this morning from the book of Ephesians, and I'll be reading from, uh, from chapter 3 of Ephesians. For this reason, beginning at verse 1, and reading from the New King James translation, for this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have, have already written, have written or briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me, who am less than the least of all saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable, the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulation for you, which is your glory. 
For this reason, I bow my knee to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church of Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Sister Yvonne McFadden is going to lead us in praise and worship. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, God. We bless your name, Jesus. Father, we magnify your name, God. We glorify your name, O oh God. We seek to glorify your name today, oh God. We seek to lift your name high. Jesus, we lift it high. Hallelujah. Let praises rise from the inside, from the inside.
may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Again, it's good to be in the house of worship this morning. And we thank the Lord for everyone who's gathered today. Uh, before I go into the word, I, 
I was reminded yesterday as I was thinking about worship today that since our order of worship has changed during this pandemic, some things we're not doing, and one of them is that we've not, not been doing an offertory appeal. And I understand that for committed people, you don't have to do an offertory appeal. You don't have to ask. But we have a whole lot of people that's not at the same level. So when you look at the financial statement and you see that there are people that are not giving, and you see that certain things are dropping, in particular our missions offering, and maybe I shouldn't be the one who says this, but the pastor's partner's offering, uh, and you don't have to give to that if you don't want to give to that. Uh, that's up to you, but you know, I just want to encourage us to give. I want to encourage us to give. In particular, uh, our regular tithes and offerings, and included in that is our missions offering. Uh, the work that we're engaged in around the world continues to go on, and even though we have other churches that help us, uh, we're the primary church. So when our funds are not what it needs to be, there's always a shortfall. So I want to encourage us to, to, to give. The Lord has blessed us tremendously in the United States of America. Uh, and of course, you know, a lot of us will live uh, way beyond where we need to live. Uh, I was ministering in, in Minneapolis and and the pastor's wife said to a comment that I made, she said, you know, you said some things I never thought about uh, when it comes to how we live and how we prepare to support the work of ministry. Uh, you know, because we should be trying to get out of debt so we can have more to give. I understand that a lot of our people are in that middle group of people that are still buying homes and sending their children to college or preparing, still having children and what have you, and we don't have that. A lot of the older people who've, who've gotten past some of those bills, but we still should learn how to be good stewards of what the Lord has blessed us with so that we can give to the work of ministry. And I want to encourage us, those of us who are slacking, those of us who are just not giving, uh, maybe Maybe you think that because you're not coming to the sanctuary that there's no need for you to give. Or maybe you're giving to other ministries. And I thought about that and I said, well, that's just like, that's like the man that, that has two families and he leaves one family <laughs> lacking <laughs> while he takes care of the outside family. Well, this is the inside family. Take care of home first. Amen. I'm not telling you not to give anywhere else, but take care of, of home first. First, let's, let's give, saints. Uh, you can, as you come in the sanctuary, the offering baskets are on the table outside. Uh, and so make sure that you write your check and put it in the offering or give online. But please, ma'am and please, sir, let's give and let's give consistently. I thank God for those of you who are very consistent, uh, those of us who are very consistent in our giving. Amen. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you for that. We're here to serve people. Let's never forget that we're here to serve people. Many times, the things that we do, like open our facility to, to host funerals or what have you, and we don't charge people for that. We may ask for a gift, but we don't charge because the church is here to serve. Amen. Amen. We're here to serve. We're here to be a light among the darkness, in the midst of the darkness of the world around us. Uh, we're not here to make money off of people. But as we give, the Lord will supply our need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Thank you. Praise the Lord. And so you'll see posted online, appeal to give. Those of you who are watching online, if you're blessed through the, through the word and through the worship today, sow a seed. So let's see. I believe this is good ground. 
because we're, we're not only being blessed here in the United States, but we're blessing people in many other countries of the world. We're going to go into the Word this morning. I know it's a little bit cool, uh, so, but we need to do that. We need to keep air flowing. Uh, COVID-19 is still around, and we want to continue to meet. I don't want to close down the sanctuary because we can't meet in the sanctuary because people have gotten sick for coming. So thank you for wearing your mask. Thank you for those of you who stayed at home because you had a fever this morning or you were sick. Thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate that. All right. So uh, bear with the cold. Bring a jacket next Sunday. Uh, we, left, we were leaving the door open so we could get some outside air, but I found out that a snake was trying to come in last Sunday, a few Sundays ago, so... We can't watch the door back there. <laughs> so, so bear with us with the air. Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 19. Um, For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts. I, I want to read that again because I, I want to I I make sure that I'm emphasizing correctly. All right. So for this reason, I bow my knees to, to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to com comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. I want to talk about grasping the amazing magnitude of God's love. Grasping the amazing magnitude of God's love. Father, thank you for this preaching moment. Thank you for your anointing. I depend on you, Lord. I look to you, Father, for a fresh anointing of your spirit so that I may communicate this word as you desire it to be communicated. So speak to my heart as I speak to your people. Lord, lift the words from the pages. Put the, put the word, the word that you've placed in my heart cause me to communicate that as I yield my faculties to you. Anoint all of us afresh that yokes will be destroyed and burdens removed from our lives so that we might grasp the amazing magnitude of your love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Sometime uh, last week, it may have been last Sunday after I finished preaching um, in the midst of studying to teach on Wednesday night, um, I was struck by the thought that God's love is so much greater in size and magnitude than most people, even Christians, realize. Now, I know that that might sound strange, but the, the old people would say, judging by our deeds and actions. <laughs> Because it's so, one, so easy to come in the sanctuary and to sing the songs and talk about God's love, but then when you look at how it's played out in our lives, it's evident that a lot of us don't really understand, don't really grasp the, the, the magnitude of God's love. We don't really see it. Amen? It, it's so much greater than the scope of our mental and intellectual abilities, and we don't even realize it. We don't even know it because we think that we've got this figured out. We think that we've been in the church so long. We think that we've been in the Bible so long that we've got this figured out. And some of us, I'm not saying that everybody does it. I think some of, many of us are probably open as the Holy Spirit works in us, amen, for fresh revelations and fresh insights of the love of God, amen. But many people don't realize it. Many people don't realize it. As I said, we think we have God figured out. We think we know him. We think... Um, uh, we know how he works, and in reality, we, we really only have a minuscule knowledge of him and his love. 
Yes, he demonstrated his love toward us in Christ Jesus when Jesus, when we were still sinners and Christ died on the cross for us. But his great love for us goes deeper and farther and wider and higher than that. Amen. It's so great that we can't really fathom it all. Amen. We know what's been revealed to us, but we, don't, we can't fathom it all. Now, the thing that struck me about God's love is that God loves us, that, that's that, that's that God's love for us is so great in magnitude that he will take the time, that he will take his time to help me in, in, in my situation in the midst of the billions of people that live on the face of the earth. Amen. I, I'm not lost in the crowd. I'm not lost in the crowd. I, I am important to him. Not only am I important to him, but I am so important to him that the situations and the concerns of my life don't get lost among the millions of concerns that come to him day and night. Day and night. I mean, you know, people are praying to God all of the time. While we are in worship right now, other people are sleeping in other parts of the world. Sometimes we don't realize that because we're so caught up in where we are in our experience, you know. So people are praying day and night, 24-7. Amen. Somebody is calling on God. Some, some group, some thousands of people have needs that they're laying out before God. And I'm not lost in the midst of all of that. You're not lost in the midst of all of that. And God takes his time. You know, you know, you know, sometimes we want God to do things. We've been praying for situations and circumstances for years, and it seems like God is not hearing us and God is not answering us. But God takes his time, amen, to, to work out things in our lives, and it will turn off to his glory and for our good. That's, that, 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 that's tied up in the amazing magnitude of God's love. Amen. Don't, don't give up on God, the song says, because he won't give up on you. He won't do it. Amen. He won't do it. God is working right now in a situation in your life that you've been laboring over for many years. Amen. Situations you can't change. Situations you prayed about. Situations that, 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 that trouble your life and trouble your family. God has a time set. And he's working in the midst of the situation. And, if, you know, sometimes if we pay attention to what God is doing, we can see glimmers of hope. We can see change. But we have, to, we have to realize God is working with us. And we are hard people to work with. Hallelujah. Amen. We, we're stubborn. We're self-willed. Amen. We, we, we think that we are God's gift to mankind, you know. We, 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 we think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. Some of us don't think of, of, of ourselves enough, but a lot of us think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. We think we're better than everybody else, you know, and, 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 and God is looking at us, and God is saying, I'm, I'm just working this. I'm just working in the midst of this situation because I'm going to bring about my will and my good pleasure in your life. I'm going to show you who you are, and then I'm going to raise you up to be the person that you ought to be. Well, we see God. We see God as he works in people's lives. As we look at Jesus, as we look at Jesus uh, as he walked the face of the earth and his dealings with people uh, while he was on earth, we see this principle worked out. This principle is in all of the encounters, whether it was of all of Jesus' encounters, whether it was with the scribes and Pharisees. Now, now I want you to to kind of catch some of these things because what we see in the Bible, we need to start seeing where we fit in. You might not be a scribe, but you might be a Pharisee. <laughs> Whether it was with the scribes and Pharisees in their spiritual blindness, whether it was the Canaanite woman uh, who begged for him to deliver her daughter who was miserably, miserably possessed by a demon, whether it was Lazarus who was raised from the dead or the demoniac who was called Legion who lived in the graveyard or the Samaritan woman uh, that he went out of his way to minister to, all of these and more are images of the desperate predicaments that we humans find ourselves in today. 
Amen. You may not be the woman by the well, but you might be that demoniac. Amen. You, 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 you may not be the scribe and the Pharisees, but you might be Lazarus. Amen. Who died, amen, and stayed in the tomb long enough to start stinking. Mm. Mm. We have to find ourselves, and we see ourselves in the Bible. Well, when I studied the Bible, that's what I'm looking for. God, show me me. You know, show me your people, Lord God, so that I can communicate to you what you want me to communicate to your people. Amen? You know, and I study the Word, and I hear the Bible says, do not think more highly of yourself than you ought to think, but think, but think soberly as God has dealt to every man, every person, the measure of faith. So I kind of keep myself, you know, try to keep myself trust in the Holy Ghost, in balance, so that I don't think of myself as being better than anybody else. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, 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 uh, just as Jesus did while he was physically on earth and taking his time, you know, some situations he ministered to immediately, some situations like Lazarus, he waited three days. He took his time to go. He took his time to work in the situation. You know, so don't think God has forgotten about you. God is just taking his time. He has the right time. And what did Jesus say to his disciples? He said, he, when they said that he's dead by now, he stinks by now, he said, that's good. <laughs> it's for the glory of God. It's for your benefit. So you can see the glory of God. Amen? So there's some people in your family that God wants to allow you to see his glory. You've given up on them. You thought that they were so low down and so dirty and so evil and so mean that there was no hope for them. But God, amen, is the sovereign God. He sees what you don't see. He knows what you don't know. He looks from a different perspective that you, and his love is so great. Ooh, Lord have mercy. Yeah, the Bible says in 2 Peter 3 and 9, the Lord is not slack or slow in keeping his promises as some men count slackness, okay? As some understand slowness, instead he is patient. He is patient with us, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. You wonder why you have not been struck down, because God is patient. You ought to thank God for his patience. And all of that, all of that is tied up in the magnitude of his love. The reason he has not killed you <laughs> or me because of our sins is because of the magnitude of his love. We may call it grace. We may call it grace. However, it is still within the scope of the magnitude of his love a magnitude that's difficult for us to grasp. Amen. Now, now we may want to grasp it for us, but what we miss is, is that same love is extended to us, is extended to everybody that's born in the image and like, that's made in the image and likeness of God. Amen. Even that person who's not saved yet. God hadn't killed them. God hadn't, hadn't taken them out of here because of the magnitude of his love. Mm. We need to grasp the magnitude of his love. We talk about the love of God. We sing about the love of God. We preach and teach about the love of God. We cry sometimes. Have you ever been overwhelmed when you thought about how and considered the love of God in your life? Oh, yes. Yet none of us, I believe, fully understand or fully grasp the magnitude of his love. Amen. As I was studying the other day, this is what slapped me in my face and stirred my heart to the point of worship. Uh, yeah, the magnitude, the magnitude of God's love. It arrested me when I just thought about it. Amen. All the week long, I've been thinking about it. The magnitude of God's love. And, and it sent me on a quest uh, uh, to dig deeper in this because people today, especially believers, especially believers, amen, need to understand this. You see, people are walking away from God because they don't understand the magnitude of his love. And we're not equipped to help them sometimes. 
help them understand the magnitude of his love. People are judging and condemning each other because they don't understand the magnitude of God's love. Amen? People are living in guilt and condemnation because they don't understand the magnitude of God's love. People are continuing in sin even because they don't understand the magnitude of God's love. They're not grasping it. People, people, people are putting God in a box because they don't understand the magnitude, the amazing magnitude of God's love. If we would embark on this journey of seeking and understanding of the magnitude of God's love, it would help us in our relationship with God, amen, and it would help us in our relationship with one another. In our relationship with God, uh, it would help us as he seeks to pull us closer to him and help us understand him and his will and his way so much better. It would help us be faithful stewards of the responsibilities that he's given to us. And it would help us overcome those demons that keep us from experiencing the fullness of his love. And as I said, tremendously, it would help us in our relationships with one another and, and with others. Amen. Because many times when you use one another, you're just talking about that little circle that you deal with, your little family. You love your family, you don't love anybody else's family. Or you love those families that love your families, you know. Sometimes we're like the, and on television, the Hatfields and the McCoys. There have been, there have been feuding between families for generations. One of the wonderful things I love about this church is that we are made up of people from other places. All of you all didn't, excuse, excuse what I'm saying, all of you all didn't grow up in York. So you don't have the opportunity to have feud in families. But you watch churches that come from the same community. And the people come from the same community. You're not, if you don't understand what I'm saying, I won't make it any plainer. But just watch it. In churches, there are families that don't like each other. And, and it's been going on for generations. Is that God? Mm. So you see what I'm talking about. In the body of Christ, many of us do not understand or do not care about, maybe, the magnitude of God's love. But we need to embark on this journey. In our text for today, Paul addresses this issue. Listen again to his words as he prays for the believers at Ephesus. He says, as he talks about his calling uh, to be the Apostle to the Gentiles, sent to minister specifically, he recognized his calling to go specifically to the Gentiles, all right? And don't, don't, don't lose me on this, okay? He says, for this reason, all right, um, wait, hold up, for this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, this is where I was going to pick up, at, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit, where? In the inner man, that Christ may dwell where? In your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now in this portion here, let me say this because I'm not going to deal with this as I go further, but let me say this. When he says that you may, that, that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, and he doesn't say what, but he goes on to say to know the love of Christ. So he's talking about us knowing the length, the, the, the width, the width, the length and depth and height of the love of Christ. That's what he's dealing with right here, okay? The focus of this request is not on the intellect of a person, all right? What do you mean by intellect? So, so I'm educated. All right, I can, I can, I can, I know how to use uh, 
uh, tools to help me understand things, all right? So I can, I can look up words in a dictionary. I can go to a commentary, and I can look up meanings of Scripture, all right? I can have a head knowledge, all right? I can have a head knowledge, and I understand things, but he's not dealing with inner intellect here, all right? Uh, he's dealing with the indwelling of Christ, and not even the initial indwelling, but on his continual presence, what Christ will do in you as he makes his home in you. Amen. How Christ will work in you as he makes his home in your inner person. Amen. He's not renting. All right. He's, he's not a renter. He's not visiting. All right. He didn't come to your house for a visit. He didn't come in your heart for a visit. He came to dwell there. He came to make his home in your heart. Amen. And as he dwells in you, as he dwells, as he's made his home in you, then in his inner workings in you, he begins to reveal to you the width or the breadth, he says, which deals with width, with width the, the, the height or the length and the depth and the height of the love of Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord have mercy. I hope we're getting this. Well, we'll get it as I go further. Amen. He's dealing with his, 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 his continual presence. And, and as I said, well, as the commentary teaches us, the verb is a strong verb. When it talks about dwelling, when it uses the word dwell or the indwelling, he's not dealing with a temporary home. He's not dealing with a temporary home. Remember, Jesus said to his disciples, in John chapter 14, verses 18 and 20, he says, as he talks about going away to leave them, he said, I will not leave you helpless. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Then he says in verse 20, I will be in you, meaning that he will live in you. Now, a lot of us think about, and, and we, we know, as we've taught, that we are, we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. We are baptized as we into the Holy Spirit or into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. Amen. He comes to dwell in us. And we've talked about how he doesn't leave us, but we lose the sense of his presence and we lose the sense of his joy when we sin. All right? Now, 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 what, 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 what the Holy Spirit is trying to get us to see is, is that we need to resist the devil and not resist him. As he's working in us, as he dwells in us, as he has made his home in us, that means that he's living there. He's living in us, and as he's living in us, he's changing us. He's transforming us, amen, amen, by his spirit from glory to glory. Amen. In our hearts, in our inner being, not our mind. And the word heart there, amen, means one's personality, the thoughts, the will, the emotions, and whatever else lies at the center of our being. Because, you know, we used to sing that song, there's something on the inside, working on the outside, brought about a change in my life. Well, it was someone Amen, work it on the inside of me. Amen, the Holy Spirit work it on the inside of me. Now, now, in this process, as I'm growing in the Lord, amen, I have to learn, I have to learn this consistency. I have to learn this consistency with allowing him, amen, to dwell in me and do his work undisturbed, unhindered. Amen. Amen. I hope you're getting the picture. Because as he's trying to, as he's trying to, 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 to unveil his love in us, and we are committing sin, now he has to deal with the sin in our lives. Amen. Now he has to work to bring us back to him. Now he has to work to bring forth the knowledge of our need for repentance back to us. We've, we've interrupted the other work he was trying to do in us to, just, to bring about his understanding of his love. And sometimes, saints, we, 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 we take sin so lightly. Doesn't have, to be, doesn't have to be selling drugs or fornicating. It could be gossiping and lying. We take it so lightly. We pay no attention to it. 
We have, we have issues with people that we won't forgive them of. And we take it so lightly. You know, if we grew up in a family that gossips, then we feel like that's the way to do. But the Holy Ghost is telling you that's not the way to do. If you get in the Bible and you take the Bible seriously, you read his word and he tells you how we ought to live. And as we strive to do that, we have the helper living inside of us to help us in this process. You know, I thank the Lord for these teachings on the Holy Spirit. Amen. I thank God for helping us develop sound theology. But again, the Lord is not dealing with intellect. You can have all this in your mind, but he wants it in your being. He wants to transform the way you think. He wants to transform your will, your mind, your emotions. That's what he's working at. He's not just one of us walking around with big heads of knowledge. Yeah. So he's working. Holy Spirit is working in, the, in your inner man, your inner woman, your inner person. Amen? Amen. And, and we, he's transforming us. He's transforming us into his image, into his image, into his image image into his image you stand and look at yourself in the mirror is God wanting to look like you then we'd be all looking he'd be, he'd be a schizophrenic God but he'd have all of these different colors and all these different hairstyles you know and, and then he'd be well, well he, he's not talking about physical image. He's not dealing with physical image. He's dealing with his, his, his very being. God is a spirit. And Jesus said that they will come when those who worship him will worship him in spirit and in truth. He's dealing with your spiritual image. So he's dealing with the inner man, the inner person, transforming us to be like him. The implication is that the more the Spirit empowers our lives, the greater will be our transformation into the likeness of Christ. If God is love, he's transforming us into that image. He's transforming us into that image. Whew. Wow. Yeah, but we say we love people. We love them as sometimes as far as we can see them. Or we love them until they do something we don't like. And when we talk about this, we have to remember, we have to remember what Jesus said about the man that went from Jerusalem to Jericho and who helped him. And he asked, the man asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? And that's why he told the parable. You see, the person you need to love is that person maybe that's so much unlike you. That's the person you need to love. And sometimes it's your husband. Sometimes it's your wife. <laughs> How many people have gotten divorced because they didn't love their husband and their wife like they loved their neighbor? I used to tell people, you know, well, we don't do much of this anymore, but the, older church, the other churches I pastored, the people would take care of me. They would cook for me. I mean, when I was at Fishing Creek, y'all know it. I, I didn't have to cook. And especially when I was single, I mean, I had food all the time. I had more food than I could eat. But some people would say, oh, my wife doesn't cook like this until the pastor's coming over. I said, listen, if you can't cook for your husband like this when it's just you and him, then don't cook, for, don't cook like this when I come over. You hear me? Thank God you honor me as your pastor. But you got to, wives, you have to honor your husbands, and husbands, you have to honor your wives. Amen. When I cook for other people, I cook the same way I cook at home. Amen. I'm not going to do for somebody else that I'm not willing to do for my wife and my child. Amen. I tell my son all the time, everything I have is for you. Don't worry about what I give to other people. 
Because everything I have for my wife and my son belongs to them. And I'll never give more to someone else than I'll give to my family. Amen. But I got to give to other people. I've got to love other people. And they can't be just like me. Oh. Amen. Amen. This is, this is, this is what, what, what understanding the magnitude of God's love is all about. He's transforming us to be in his image. Not in somebody else's image. God loves everybody. Men, I like what we do. He can't love sin, but he loves the person. Amen. Now, now, now notice the results of Christ's indwelling presence, of the implications of the transformation that takes place by his indwelling presence. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. So in order, in order to stress the foundational nature of God's love, and God's love is agape, agape, sacrificial love, sacrificial love, giving love. He, uh, that he's, he uses two metaphors. He used the metaphor, one in the, in the botanical area, which deals with, with plants and trees and what have you, and the other architectural, that you would be rooted in love, okay? So, so when, when a plant is rooted correctly, that plant receives nourishment to grow, to progress, all right? So these things don't happen overnight, all right? It, you're going to find out it's, it's a lifetime that, that the Lord is, as he dwells, as he lives permanently in you, he is rooting you. He's putting you in a, in, a, in a position where you can grow in him. He's rooting you. You're like a plant. You're, you're growing. Jesus said, if you abide in me. Amen. Abiding. The branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So we have to stay there. And as we stay in the Lord and as he works and as he lives in us and is able to work unhindered in us, then there's growth that's taking place, rooted. And then he says, established in love. So as you're rooted, the foundation that you're, that you're, that you're built on is God's love. Now, God's love is different from our love because we're born in sin and shaped in iniquity. That's why we have such a problem. And it's dangerous when you think that your way is right. Amen. Even when you get saved and you think that your way is right, you're in a dangerous place because you have to, you have to be open to the Holy Spirit growing you up. Amen. And all of us know that we change as we grow. Your body doesn't look the same as it looked when you first came out of the womb. As you grew, you changed. Amen. And then as he establishes you. So in this growth process, God is establishing you like a building built on a solid foundation. That building is established. Have you ever paid attention? I was in, and well, we can't see this a lot in Charlotte because they tore tore down many of the, the older buildings in Charlotte. But in many cities in the United States, Buildings are standing in many cities in other parts of the world. And when you go to Europe and other places like that, there are buildings that were built thousands of years ago, and they're still standing. Still standing. Thousands of years ago. God wants, God wants, and that's the, that's the image of the establishment that God wants to cause in our lives, establishing us in love, in his love. Not the perspective of love that you have in the world, that you may have learned growing up in your family. That's always tainted. Amen. Even for folk in the church, because many of us in the church, as I said, don't understand, don't grasp the magnitude of God's love. Yeah. He's doing this through the strengthening of the inner person, your inner person, by the Spirit of Christ dwelling in our hearts. 
transforming us from our old nature, right, corrupted by sin, into his nature, imparted in us by his indwelling presence. Then through the process of his inner workings, we will be able to comprehend he, Paul's to the Ephesians says, with all of the saints. So this is not something just for one church, but with all of the saints. The other people have caught the knowledge. The other people have caught the revelation. And they are yielding to this transformation process. Now notice Paul says here in the text that he says this is past knowledge. Okay, so you got you to gotta, you gotta, you gotta get this because don't ever think that because of who you are in the Lord, you got it. Okay, this is beyond you. Amen. Amen. So at every point that you get an understanding, there's more to get. You, you can never put God in a box and think you haven't figured out because he is, he is so God. Uh, he is so great. He's so magnificent. He, I mean, we, we, the, he, when he was talking to Solomon about a throne, he said, the whole earth can't contain me. John wrote about the books about writing about Jesus and said the whole earth cannot contain the volumes of the books that could be written about Jesus. In the process of time, in the process of his inner working, in the process, that's why you can be in the Lord 60 years and God can give you a, a greater revelation of him. He can help you understand. You could read a scripture. You've been reading this scripture for years and years and years and years. Then all of a sudden, one day, the Lord whew, gives you revelation, gives you an insight that you didn't have before. <sighs> That's why we need, to, we, need to, we need to allow him to work. We need to stop doing stuff that hinders him whew, in his inner work in, in us. Paul, by the Spirit of Christ, is pointing out to us that without the permanent indwelling presence of Christ, the Holy Spirit, as he has made his home in our hearts and our yielding to him, hmm, working in us, we will, never, we will never attain anything or anywhere close to understanding the magnitude of his love. It's a progressive revelation. God's love is so wide, so long, so deep, and so high that we are incapable of understanding it without his permanent indwelling presence continually working in our lives to reveal it to us. <sighs> and so that's how it happens. What we do understand, he gives it to us as we yield to him. That's the how. That's how we grasp much of the understand, all of the understanding of, of God's love for us that we do grasp. It's by his permanent indwelling presence over time working in our lives as we yield to him, as we yield to him. That's why we must not resist him. Now, this is in our, our school of ministry lesson. Don't resist his working. Don't resist him. We must not resist him. That's why we must always be open to him working in our lives and teaches us, teaching us. That's why we must never put God in a box and think that he can only do things a certain way. Mm. That's, why, that's why we must seek to, to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That's why. You know, I said the other Sunday, you know, when we look at denominations, the church has so failed in this issue. We have not worked to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace because this group think that they had it right and that group think that they have it right and that group. And most of us today, because there have not been church councils, that we don't do church councils anymore where the church fathers come together and sit down and hash these issues out. So we are dealing with denominational things and doctrines that were written long ago. But remember, God's love is, 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 is the magnitude of his love. The magnitude, uh, glory to God, of his love is so wide, so, 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 so long, so deep, so high that it's past knowledge. So even though some 
church fathers may have understood some things like this. God could be giving fresh revelation today. All of us know that people miss some things. Now, when we fight against the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, that means we missed it. When we say that, 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 that um, what God did in the Bible in the, in the presence and person of his Holy Spirit, amen, it's not happening today, that means we've missed it. Amen. Amen. We live in the church age. We live in the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. So even though the Word of God remains the same, amen, our understanding in every generation is changed many times. Some things don't change, but some things do because some people missed it. Some people missed it. Some people missed it. And I'm not saying that I got it all right, but I'm saying to you this, I'm open to the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. We, we, yeah. So, so, so we, 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 must, we must preserve his unity in the bond of peace. And saints, it, I mentioned denominations, but in every church, we have to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. If we don't preserve it, if we don't work to keep confusion down in the body, amen, then we are resisting the Holy Ghost. Amen. So then, if somebody offends me, this is what I need to do. I need to check myself. I need to be willing to forgive right away. I can't hold this thing. The Bible says, it says, uh, be angry but sin not, and do not allow the sun to go down on your wrath. So if you offend me before sundown, I need to deal with me, not you. Uh-uh. The Holy Ghost will deal with you. And I may have to say to you, well, I was offended by this. I don't even need to tell you you offended me because I could have misunderstood what you said. But I need to deal with me before the sun. Now, how many Christians do that? On the contrary, people hold stuff for years. Resisting the Holy Ghost. When the Holy Spirit is trying, amen, to impart to you a deeper understanding of his love, the magnitude of his love, he has to deal with that sin, that anger, that bitterness in your heart that you have against your brother, your sister in Christ. We can't resist him. He said, Bishop, you don't understand. I, I understand. We feel good when we hold stuff against people. We feel like they owe us something. You forget that the Lord forgave you. And cast your sin as far as the east is from the west. Cast it in the sea of forgetfulness that it would never arise to condemn you in the judgment. But yet you want to be paid back. Oh, Bishop, it's just hard to forgive. I try to forgive, but let the Holy Ghost work in you. You'll forgive. You'll forgive. You'll let it go. Amen. Because if you don't let it go, every time you see that person, you're mad at her. Yeah, it rises up in you, and it's just burning inside of you. Yeah, I want him to get, I want the Lord to get him. The Lord to deal with him. Man. I want him to get what he deserves. Mm, leave it alone. We pray, forgive us our trespasses. What? As we forgive those who trespass against us. You may not say trespasses. You may say debts. But forgive us as. So you're actually saying, Lord, if I don't forgive that person, please don't forgive me for my sins. But we don't realize what we're saying because we, we get in the habit of saying stuff. Mm. So, so, so we can't resist him. We can't resist him. Yeah, don't resist him. Don't, don't, don't uh, 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 work to preserve the unity. Work to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. <laughs> Hallelujah. This is why we must do this. We must do this. Hallelujah. And this br brings us to the last question, or one last question. Now, when I said why then, I was dealing with, you know, why uh, uh, we need this understanding of why we must not resist the Holy Spirit, why we must, must not um, uh, 
why we must preserve the unity of the spirit and the, and, and the bond of peace. But, but I want to go to a different why right here. I just I want you to follow me. Amen. A different why. Why do we need to grasp the magnitude of this love? Why is this whole issue important to the faith and important to believers? Well, as we yield to the indwelling presence of Christ, to the Holy Spirit, as we yield to the Holy Spirit, uh, so that he roots us and establishes us in love, we begin to discover just how important we are individually to God. Now, I kind of alluded to this in the beginning of the message. But, but this, this is important, you know. This is important. You know, what we discover is that, that we are not just someone born among billions of people in a world with no significance to God, okay? God loved you so much. He loved you. And I don't know if people get this. He loved you so much that he kept reaching for you. He kept calling you to him. He loved you so much that, that he sent Jesus into the world looking for you in your lostness looking for you in your sin and your degradation. God sent Jesus to seek you out and to save you. I mean, you know, we read that and we say we understand it, but I don't know if we make it personal. I was lost in sin. Amen. I was, I was, I was, I was born in sin and shaped in iniquity. I was, amen, and among all of the people in the world, that night that I accepted Jesus, I heard the Lord speaking to me. It was personal. Among, and I didn't think about this then, among all of the people in the world. So that had to be, that had to be, it was after the fourth Sunday in August in 1964. Amen. On a, on a Wednesday night, because we were in revival meeting, on a Wednesday night, when, when I heard the preacher preach and I heard the Lord speaking to me. So on that Wednesday night, do you think I was the only person in the world saved? No, 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 no. I was not the only person in the world saved. On that Wednesday night, God saved millions of others throughout the world. And I could, I cannot conceive of that. Did not conceive of that. Until the Lord began to give me a revelation of how great his love was and why I needed to understand the magnitude of his love. That in the midst of everybody else that was saved, he spoke to me. He reached me. In Blair, South Carolina, a place you hardly can find on the map, but God knew where it was. Glory to the name of Jesus. Does anybody understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, 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 don't, we, don't, we, don't, we don't, we don't always get that. We don't, we, yeah, Lord, help us. Help us, help us, help us. God loves you. He loves you. Huh. Not only did God love you, God still loves you. God still loves me in the midst of all other people that are in the world. Amen? He knows your name, the song says. He knows your address. Oh, Lord, have mercy. He knows the number of hairs that are on your head. Glory to the name of Jesus. He knows how many teeth are in your mouth. Amen. Uh, even those that are left in your mouth. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Oh, God, I thank you. Amen. The psalmist said this so beautifully in Psalm 139. He said, oh, Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down. You know my rising up. You understand my thoughts are far off. I mean, you comprehend my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all of my ways, for there is not a word on my tongue. But behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? 
If I ascend up into the heavens, you're there. If, my, if I make my bed in hell, you are there. Amen. Hallelujah. If I take the wings of the morning and fly away, glory to the name of Jesus. Amen. And dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. Even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. You form my inward parts. Hallelujah. You, you, you covered me in my mother's womb. Oh, glory to the name of Jesus. My frame is not hidden from you. When I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. He knows us. Yes. He knows your name. That means he knows what you're going through. He knows what you've been through. He knows all of your dirt. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. Stuff he's covered up from everybody else. God knows it all, and yet he loves you. Yet he loves you. His love is so deep. His love is so wide. His love is so high. His love is so long that in the midst of your mess, Oh, if we could just understand this. You might have been wrong, might have been born in what the world says was the wrong family, but God still loves you. Amen. You might have been born on the wrong side of the tracks according to the world, but God still loves you. God knows where you are. God knows what you're doing. God knows what you're going through. And he still. So when the devil tries to tell you <laughs> that God doesn't know you or that God doesn't care about you, somebody, somebody needs to hear this today. When the devil tries to tell you that God doesn't care about you or he tries to tell you that you're not important or that you are not worthy, glory to the name of Jesus, or that you, are, you have nothing to offer, you can call the devil the liar that he is. Hallelujah, because he is a liar and he is the father of lies. You don't have to listen to his lies. Listen to God. When you begin to grasp the breadth and the length, hallelujah, glory to the name of Jesus, and the depth and the heights of God and the height of God's love, glory to the name of Jesus, you'll understand why the Lord loves, still loves you after you messed up. Hallelujah. When you begin to grasp it, you'll understand, oh, glory to the name of Jesus, when he calls you worthy and you know you're not worthy, you'll begin to understand it now. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. When you grasp the length and the depth and the breadth and the height of God's love. Amen. You'll understand while you're still standing when you should have fallen a long time ago. When you begin to grasp the length and the depth and the breadth and the height of God's love, you'll understand while you're still alive when you should have been dead. Somebody shout hallelujah. Woo. Oh, my, 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 my. Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. God, I thank you for your love. And I thank you for the understanding of your love. I thank you for understanding the glimpse I've gotten of how deep and how wide and how high and how long your love is. I tried to run, but I couldn't run away. Glory to the name of Jesus. I tried to hide, but I couldn't hide from it. Hallelujah. It's so wide, you can't go around it. It's so long, you can't pass by it. It's so high. Woo. Woo. Mm. Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. Hallelujah. Now, hallelujah. I'm almost done. Thank you, Jesus. Another reason that we need to grasp the magnitude, the magnitude of God's love is because there is a grace. Listen to me. There is a grace, hallelujah, that we need to extend to others that we're in fellowship with 
or that we come in contact with. That grace is the love, is to love them like Jesus loved us and loves us. Lord, have mercy. Uh, you know, a problem with a lot of us when it comes to missions, as we see people as them and not a part of us. Uh, but Paul talks about the whole family of God that's knit together by this love. So it's not them and us, it's all of us together. Amen. So my brothers and sisters in Africa, uh, they are part of the body of Christ. And even those that are not born again, they belong to God. Amen. They are born in the image and created in the image and likeness of God. So they have the potential to be saved. I got to see them as that. I can't, can't see it as, as, as us over here and them over there. Amen. A perspective of that I've got to have is I've got to have God's perspective. And I've got to extend God's grace. I've got to extend God's grace. Yeah, you, we, we, there is a grace that we need to extend to others. Uh, to love them like Jesus loved and loves us. He loved us in our sin and degradation. We must love them in their sin and degradation. Woo, God help us today. Help the church today now. God help the church because we, we got saved. We got sanctified. We got filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, now we are holy. And God says, come out from among them and touch not the unclean thing so that you unclean. I can't touch you now. God didn't say lay in the bed with them. God said you got to love them in order to save them. You got to love them in order to draw them. In love, he drew you. In love, he drew me. So in love, we got to reach them so that God can draw them. Got to love them like Jesus loved us. He loved us in our foolishness. Any of y'all ever been foolish? I know now, uh-uh. No, you've been in church too long. You're not going to admit it. But you've been foolish. Mm. Yes, you have. You've been, no, nah, I've been saved all my life. No, you ain't been saved all your life. That's a lie from the pit of hell. You ain't been saved all your life. Uh-uh, no, no, that's why your mama had to whip you sometimes. That's why your daddy had to whip you sometimes, because you did bad things. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, now, so, so, now, understand that in our, in our strength, we cannot do this. Amen. Amen. But with the power of the indwelling presence of Christ, the Holy Spirit, we can do it. We can love, love people with the love, the same kind of love. Because remember, we are being transformed into his image. Into his image. So if I'm in his image... And the Holy Spirit is transforming me into him and his image, then he's transforming me to, to transforming me to love people like he loves people. And to treat people like he treats people. Whew. God help us today. Whew. Whew. It's God's love in Christ that provides the motivating power that enables believers to love others. It's God's love in Christ that provides the motivating power that enables believers to love others. Certain things you can expect from non-believers, but from believers, as we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and he's working in our lives, in our inner man, and transforming us to be like him. That's what it means to be like Jesus. That way you can see people in the holiness church with long dresses on and their doilies on their head, and they can be as mean as a rattlesnake because they're not allowing, the, they can speak in other tongues, that's why speaking in tongues is not the evidence of the Holy Ghost. Ooh, my, 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 my. You better look for the fruit of the Spirit. We can dress up and come to church and look wonderful and talk wonderfully with each other. But inside, the inner man, that inner person. So he dwells in us, transforming us. Be like him. And we need it because we need to see ourselves as valuable to God, important. You, you, 
know how many people feel like nobody sees them, nobody knows them, nobody loves them. God, they believe. Some people, somebody listening right now, you feel like you're going through something and God does not even love you. I want to tell you right now, God loves you. God knows your name. He knows what you're experiencing in your life. You might be in a struggle in your inner person, but God knows that struggle. He knows that you are. He wants you to know you're important to him. And we need to do this because there are people that we need to grace with his love as we go through this life. Whew. The magnitude of God's love. The magnitude Amazing magnitude. Paul prayed that the church will comprehend with all of the saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height of God's love. That love that surpasses, it goes beyond knowledge. It's what Holy Spirit parts, as he indwells, as he makes his home in the believer. And then he says, and I'm done, and we will be filled with the fullness of God. Hmm. You might have got so full that you couldn't talk in your own language. But this goes beyond speaking in tongues. A lot of what we experience in church is emotions. And that's okay. We're emotional beings. Sometimes we copy what we see other people doing. But God says, I want to deal with your inner man. You, individually. You. And when, you are, when you are all by yourself and the Lord arrests you, He's dealing with you. Oh, my goodness. But, but you know, it's a matter of, of us understanding and yielding. God, there's, there are things about you that I don't know. There are things about you that I don't understand. There, there's, 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 there's a place in you that I haven't attained yet. Help me not to be so full of myself that I think I know it all. I think I've got it all. Help me. It's my prayer today that our desire will be to grasp the amazing magnitude of God's love. God, I thank you. Amen. Let's stand. Today, maybe there's someone who needs Jesus as Savior and Lord. A part of his amazing love, the magnitude of his amazing love, is that he reaches us where we are. And you may be listening online. You know, maybe everyone in the sanctuary has confess Christ as Savior and Lord. But even where you are right now, if you're listening to me online, whether you're at home or on your job or in your car, don't just hear me speak. Hear the Lord speaking to you. Just like he drew me to him and drew others to him, he wants to draw you. He's drawing you to him. He wants us to respond. He wants us to say yes. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I receive you. I surrender. I yield my life to you. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and for my sins. He did. It was personal for you. He became that sufficient sacrifice, that substitute, your substitute, 
You deserve death because God's law says the soul that sins shall surely die. But Jesus took your place, died on the cross for you. Now all he wants you to do is accept the sacrifice that he made. Accept him and yield your life to him as Lord and Savior. If you want to do that, I will lead you in a prayer of confession. You pray that prayer because it, and because it is your desire and your will to be saved, the Lord will save you. So just pray along with me now. Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner. I cannot save myself. I deserve death for my sin because I've sinned against God's holy law. I've sinned against God. But Jesus... You took my place. You died on the cross for me. Thank you, Lord. I accept your sacrifice for me. Lord Jesus, I accept you as my Savior and my Lord. Please come into my life. Save me from my sin. And Lord, because of what you said in your word, as many as received you, you gave them the right to become your sons and your daughters. Because I've received you, I thank you for my salvation. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for receiving me. Thank you for making me your child. Thank you, Lord. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, it's just that simple, but yet it's a bit complicated in that it has to be your will, not because you repeat it after me. It has to be your desire. Because it's your desire, the Lord has saved you. Now write to us and let us know of the decision that you've made so that we can follow up with you. We point you to a church in your area where you can grow in the Lord or if you want to connect with this ministry. Now write to us and let us know. Someone will see what you write. Write it there in the comment section. There are people watching. They will catch it. They will, and we will make contact with you. This is a wonderful place to be in relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to pray for all of us. Just lift your hands for you. Lord, thank you for your word and the power of your word. Thank you for your indwelling presence. Thank you, God, for the depth, the width, the length, and the height of your love. Thank you for, as you dwell in us, you impart understanding and insight, and you show us just how great your love is, even in our own lives. Thank you for your forgiveness. For yes, we've sinned and we've come short of your glory. But you said that if we confess our sins, you will be faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you, Lord. So we confess today our sins before you and to you. Thank you for your cleansing power. Thank you for your help. Thank you for letting us know that you know us. There's nothing hidden from your eyes. We are important to you. Thank you, Lord, for that person that's struggling in their life right now. We're feeling significant. We're feeling important. I pray a special grace be released upon them and that you will minister to their hearts right now. Give them hope. Give them help. Meet our every need. I pray for those that are sick among us. I plead the blood of Jesus against every sickness and every disease. I speak your healing virtue and your healing grace released in every believer's life today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your help. Thank you for your hope. Thank you for encouraging us. It's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray and we thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming today. I pray that the word has blessed your life, blessed your heart. Please don't forget to give your tithes and offerings. Whether you give online or if you're here, 
uh, leave a check, uh, leave your cash, do it in the envelope. Don't forget to pray for each other. Pray for each other. Amen. As we go forth from this place today. May the Lord bless you. Now may the grace of God, the love of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ, the sweet communion of his Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with us now, henceforth, and forevermore. The people of God said together, Amen. God bless you all.